Good afternoon, Nerd Fam, and welcome back for the last time to Salt Lake City, Utah. We're here at the very end of day three of our three days of coverage at KubeCon North America. My name's Savannah Peterson, joined by the ultimate rock star after that swag segment, Rob Strache. <laughs> Rob, we have had so much fun this week. This, this has been great, and I think, again, some of the major themes that have been going on have really you know, played out, especially today with community, a lot of the excitement that's going on, a lot of multi-cloud and how to make things simpler is playing out. And I think, you know, again, that really leads well into this last segment where we're going to bring it home strong. We're going to bring it home so strong. Jay, thank you so much for taking time during a busy week to come hang out with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on the, the last, uh, last uh, session. Yeah, you're bringing it home. You're, you're, and you're, we save the best for last, baby. Best for last, exactly. And you go after the deaf and hard of hearing working groups, so no pressure. Yeah, I, I know. It you was. It was extremely <laughs> inspiring. <laughs> you, gotta, you really got to bring the heat for us today, Jay. This is your first KubeCon North America. It How's is. the week been? The week has been uh, absolutely amazing. I, you know, I think the amount of energy at this KubeCon has been great. The amount of uh, conversations that you've had sort of around new technologies, everybody's excited about how to make things better. Um, I've just had so many deep conversations that I'm going to leave here with like thousands of ideas on what to do next. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. I want to hear some of those as we get farther into this, farther into this interview. Multi-cloud is having a moment. It's been a conversation that we've had countless times on the desk this week. And, and it's interesting, because I, I will say it was not necessarily as much of a conversation at the last few KubeCons. How do you all play into that? And that's probably got to feel good for you. Yeah, it does feel good. You know, and, and I think you know, if we take a look back at how people approach cloud at first, it was like one cloud. Like we're going to go all in on one cloud. We want to train everybody in one cloud. And then people thought about concentration risk. And they said, oh, well, we need at least another cloud. And, we, and what we saw then was they would take a particular architecture or a particular application and just duplicate that uh, into another cloud. Now as people sort of think about the ways that they're tying these platforms together and people are adopting more cloud native ways of deploying these applications, they see that they have an opportunity to take services, specific services, and find the best price performance per service across each of those clouds. And so now we have a sort of a more complex problem that we need to be able to solve in order to make sure that people have an opportunity to build the best applications that they can. So, so how, for those who aren't aware, I mean, uh, you guys were on the main stage today. Uh, yeah, you're big making day. some, you know, pledges and donations. Kind of go into that and help people understand where Akamai fits into this whole community. Absolutely, so three years ago we made an acquisition of Linode and launched Akamai Connected Cloud. So we've integrated Linode onto the Akamai backbone so you get all the great performance that you have from the Akamai network and now with this new cloud computing capability. As we move forward, what we want to do is to try to get compute closer to those end users. So just like um, Akamai did with content, with our CDN, and getting content closer to um, those users, we want to do the same with compute in order to create new possibilities and new capabilities. Now, a requirement for that is really the Kubernetes platform because it allows you to have these services that you can actually move to the edge. And today it's kind of difficult to manage that, as I mentioned, across multiple clouds. So one of the things that we announced uh, this morning was the Akamai app platform. And that allows developers or platform engineers to get quickly started, not just with Kubernetes on Akamai, but also with the other associated upstream projects which are really required to make a platform that is usable by developers. So it's super exciting to be able to get people to get quickly started with Argo or with key, uh, key management, secrets management, everything you need for your developers and everything needed to take away that toil from those developers and automate as much of that as possible with these golden paths in order to get those things set up quickly. Really what we want to do is make sure that we, uh, in the words of uh, Alan Kay, keep the simple things simple, but make sure the complex things are possible. So while we do provide those golden paths, we also want to make sure that they can customize that for the requirements of their applications and for their organization. Uh, another thing that we announced actually earlier this year, but you know, we're still excited about is a uh, million dollars worth of funding Thank for the CNCF projects. So we want to make sure that while we're uh, 
using the capabilities of Kubernetes for our customers, that we're giving back to the community as well. That's a huge contribution and a huge deal. I'm curious because, I mean, first of all, you said quite a few things that we're going to have to unpack, but I'm going to go in reverse order. Million dollars, not a small sum of money. Why now? Look, Akamai uh, previously, we're, we're really not known as a cloud company first of all, and we're really not known as an open source organization. And this year we upgraded our, um, our membership from silver to gold, and we really want to make sure that we continue to do more and more with CNCF. As Akamai sort of expands to this vision of distributed cloud and knowing that we really need this community to help us get there, that they're going to be able to help us solve problems that we can't solve on our own, that realizing that sort of all of us are smarter than any one of us, um, it's important to give back and it's important to um, make sure that we're providing a space for that and that we can be a, a, a part of the conversation and, and be a part of this community. I, I love that. I, I, that culture of collaboration that you just hit on is, is so cool. And I really do feel, Rob and I have been talking about it all week, it feels like, I mean, the, the open source community has always been very collaborative, but it feels particularly collaborative right now as we skateboard off this on-ramp of Kubernetes and AI adoption really just intersecting. And so the timing of all of this is, is super cool. You talk about these golden pathways. I like that visual, by the way. It took me immediately to Wizard of Oz, and I thought, oh, that's kind of fun. I hadn't, hadn't really thought about it like that. What are some of the use cases and, and customer applications that you're seeing out in the wild currently and that you also think will benefit from the announcements this week? Yeah, look, so the app platform as example, so you know, um, Kyvernos, it's a great, you know, great uh, project, um, being able to apply security to Kubernetes now. They announced you know, a new Kyvernos certification. So imagine me as a developer trying to set up a platform, a Kubernetes platform, but also realizing not only do I have to know how to install Kubernetes and go and get configured on that and possibly get certified on that, now maybe I need to go learn Argo and get certified on that, and now maybe I need to go and learn Kyvernos and go get certified in that and understand how to set up the security. That could take me months, you know, even as a team in order to make yeah. sure that I've got something that's enterprise ready, that's production ready, that gives me everything I need to run my applications for a multi-tenant team. What the app platform does is it automates a lot of that. So you can, with a few clicks, so within 20 minutes, have all of that deployed and ready to run and ready to work with and to play with. And along with that, it comes with pre-configured Kyverna. So it actually has a lot of those policies already implemented for you. So you do not have to do the work. Again, it allows you to get started very, very quickly. But again, with that sort of ability to customize when you have to and when you need to. And I think that's been one of the things that we've been talking about is really how to make things simple. Um, at, from the app platform perspective, how many of the upstream projects can you actually bring down or is, it, is there a, a subset or is it, like you said, just all of them or how, how does that work? There are a lot of projects. Certainly we don't support all of them at the moment, yeah. but we're going to onboard as many as we can over time. Right now we have a little over a dozen of the upstream projects. We're trying to focus, of course, on the most popular ones that need that sort of uh, basis for implementation. But we have the ones you would think about needing for any sort of application. Secrets management, key management, uh, security, um, uh, your service mesh, all of that stuff can be pre-installed. How, how do you see the workloads like you said, you're, you're newer to being a hyperscaler. How do you see the workloads and how do they differ from workloads that people are maybe taking to Google, AWS, or you know, uh, Azure? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we see when people are, are using Akamai is they want to make sure that their workloads are in fact portable across clouds. And so they are very concerned about lock-in to a certain particular ecosystem. That's one of the things we definitely wanted to avoid with the app platform. While we provide a highly opinionated implementation, we want to make sure that they configure it, they can configure it as well. And you can actually export that as well. So you can take that Helm chart and actually go anywhere and run that same thing. So we want to give you that capability, but we also want to make sure we continue to give that portability and we're really supporting a, an open network in the true sense of the word. Because you have that network, backbone and you have a lot of this and you have the expertise in the CDN side of the house, 
Do you see that org organizations are looking at you guys uh, in a new wave, maybe for like inference, where the, I, need, I need this to be close to my customers, I need it to be quick, maybe not as much on the training side where I'm going to maybe a GPU crazy, you know, we had you know, some of the other guys on earlier in the week around that they got hundreds of thousands and millions of GPUs. How do you see that playing out? Because that would seem like a perfect, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So, Good question, Rob. yeah, you know, I think when people think of Akamai, the first thing they probably think of is CDNs, and they think of sort of that aspect, and over the past 10 years, adding security then on top of that, but always sort of more from a, a different perspective than some of the hyperscalers, because we're sort of edge in rather than data center out. Uh, and we're going to, you know, to use that heritage, we're going to use that capability we've developed over the past 25 years to continue to grow those edge capabilities with things like compute. So instead of being just a content delivery network, why couldn't we actually create a compute delivery network and get as close to the users or to the device or to the, you know, the autonomous vehicle, whatever it is you're trying to speak with at the edge, get as close to that as possible. And what we see is this new era of more sort of affinity computing, right? So whether it's a user, whether it's a specific type of processor, whether it's your data, where does that process need to run in order to be the most effective? You brought up something that, well, I happen to be a big Edge fan here, so you're speaking my language. But in case folks aren't familiar, why is it so important to get that as close to the end user or to the device or to the car? Yeah, so well, for a number of reasons, right? So the first one is latency, right? So by being able to get this at the access edge where Akamai has these points of presence, you can actually reduce it to single digit uh, millisecond latency. Uh, to those users in That's those locations. That's insanely fast. Yeah, right, so today we have like 4,100 edge points of presence. We don't have all of those enabled with compute yet, but over time we're going to be, enabled, uh, going to be able to enable hundreds of those uh, locations to get as close to the users as possible. So one of them is latency. Uh, the other reason you might want to do that is for regulatory purposes. Perhaps data has to stay in a certain location. Let's say you're doing an AI inference model. Let's say it's a healthcare related AI inference model. How can I make sure that that is going to stay uh, as private as possible? How are we going to make sure that stays in a particular geography inside of a country or even in a metro area? So there are all sorts of capabilities like that. Another one that you might want to look at uh, are things like sustainability. Perhaps I want this to run not necessarily in the closest to the user, but the most sustainable location, the one with the least amount of carbon emissions. I could choose to do that. Um, what if I wanted to be able to run that um, uh, with, where it has the least amount of cost, right? It can choose to actually move those workloads around the globe based on the needs of my organization. And, it's, go for it. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> We're and, both excited. Yes, that's all that yeah, matters, no, clearly. I, I think, again, <laughs> it, it, I think that's, I love that you brought up the sustainability angle yeah, because of the fact that it's, it's a, it's a, it, big thing, and we were chatting about it before we got up here, it's, you know, there's only so much power. Uh, what are you seeing from people when you have those, I mean, you're out of Singapore, we know that that's a very, you know, constrained uh, power company, you know, from the government runs all of that. We're seeing that Virginia has no more power for data centers at this point. We're hearing about, you know, Three Mile Island being turned up by the Microsoft guys again, and, you know, Constellation. How do you see that conversation with people around sustainability and how is that driving some of their choices? With yeah, you? it's it's interesting because you know in, any sort of uh, conversation around sustainability also ends up being a conversation around cost efficiency as well because they really are trying to maximize what they can get with while having also the least amount of impact and you know I, I guess sustainability is is. Having a sustainability uh, agenda is also having a uh, cost efficiency agenda. Um, and so from what I've seen, uh, I think AI is probably the perfect uh, poster child for a lot of wasteful spending in terms of... <laughs> Couldn't agree with you more there. Right, just yeah. in, in terms of, you know, uh, developers always wanting sort of the fastest GPUs, even if they're not fully utilizing those GPUs. Or even a fraction of utilization, frankly. Exactly, and while there's a lot of work being done to try to slice those up in order to get greater efficiency, there are also a lot of um, GPUs that aren't at the high end that aren't being used, which are lower cost and allows individuals to have very great efficiency um, uh, like we did a quick study around particular GPUs that we found for, um, for uh, 
stable diffusion uh, a, a image uh, generation uh, image gen i model um, by picking the right gpu you could actually decrease the cost by 80% and therefore also have a more efficient um, capability there as well and you end up saving money so it's you know it's it's appropriate to sort of look at your cost spend it's appropriate to sort of look at the sustainability of an organization through that financial lens as well. Um, so it's extremely important. You, you just hit the nail on the head there. I mean, the reality is by designing a more sustainable system and, and you're going to not only be better for the planet, but save money and probably make your team a lot happier because you're not just sitting there with resources that aren't utilized. Yeah, and, and again, speaking about AI specifically, you know, I think in, 2023, everybody was just throwing as much money as they could at it. 2024 has really been all about operationalizing that. And I 100%. think 2025, they're going to be focusing on how they can efficiently run that at scale. I, I think you nailed it on the head. We're going to have to have you on as an analyst sometime today. You've certainly got your finger on the pulse. I love it. Speaking of 2025, I got one more question for you. When we're hanging out in London, what do you hope to be able to say then that you can't yet say today? Oh, um... Look, I, yeah, look, at, at Akamai, you know, we're, we're um, doing a lot, especially in the uh, open source space at the moment. Uh, we're working on a few partnerships that we hope to be able to actually announce in a few weeks, um, but um, we'll be able to talk about more uh, in London. Uh, and it's around, you know, partnerships around new ways of computing, uh, looking at, you know, it was a really interesting thing around somebody, uh, it was yesterday during the keynote, people were talking about sort of like being a hype ostrich. Like if you uh, bury, bury your head in the sand and uh, are trying to hide from the hype rather than getting ahead of it. Um, so in London, we'll be able to talk about how Akamai is trying to get, get ahead of some of that hype. Okay, the hype ostrich is a vibe. Someone needs to <laughs> meme that at this point. That's like a space fever, Rob. It's like yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, get, I can see that outfit. Yeah. Out. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, Jay, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. What a brilliant close to the day. I really appreciated your time. Great. Thank you again so much for the time. Yeah, absolutely. And Rob, thanks for being just the best all week. This has been fun. It's been great. It was a great wrap up here. And I think, you know, again, just bringing it home strong and yeah. uh, great vibe. So I feel happy. that I feel that kind of sadness in my heart because it's all over now. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to London. I am looking forward to London too. But We're all gonna have to have some fun in London on April Fool's Day, no less. I, I know, but it's not a joke that we'll be there. And, either, <laughs> exactly. and it's no not, joke no that joke. the content is gonna be absolutely outstanding in London, folks. Thank you for tuning in to all of our coverage here on the Cube. Thirty segments from Salt Lake City, Utah, here at KubeCon North America. Big thank you to our fabulous production team: Anderson, Coney, Christian, Tony. Also to the sales squad here. We've got Frank. We've got Mike. And, and to the whole gang back at home doing pre-records, there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that y'all don't see that I am very grateful for. Not to mention they have to listen to my voice all day, which in itself deserves the trophy. My name's Savannah Peterson. Thanks for tuning in to our fabulous coverage here of KubeCon North America 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.